Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the OU, the RCA, the Igor Arban and Rabbi Tenenbaum for having us here in the shul and for the support of all of these great national organizations. And for our executive committee, we have a couple of uh, the members of our executive committee here tonight, Chaim Dweck, Rafi Newgarten from Passaic, and um, many other people who I know here. Mark Weiss is also on our executive committee. And I would also like to thank Mr. Mark Appel, because without him, tonight would not have happened. I think I could touch up Mark Appel very shortly and concisely, and more Ma'atva Seharbe, which is this week's Parsha, that he doesn't talk that much about what he does, he just does. Speaking of the Parsha, I only have a few minutes because I don't want to keep the oil too late tonight. I'm going to say a short vart from that I just heard this Shabbos. I spoke in a shul in Queens for the National Week. They invited me. And the rabbi introduced me, Rabbi Hertz, in Utopia Parkway. And he said a, a, a short word from the Parsha, which is actually a very deep psychological insight. In this past week's Parsha, we have, we heard already about how Sar Imenu corrected Avraham Avinu to protect Yitzchak from the bad influence and the molestation of Yishmael, the abuse whether it was emotional abuse, sexual abuse, physical abuse, spiritual abuse, teaching him the wrong way. And they sent Yishmael away, even though it pained the Abraham. Sometimes it's painful to do the right thing to protect our children. The, the, the Torah says that when he went away with his mother, Hagar, that they were in Sakana. They were in danger. And Hagar told Yishmael, to stay under the bushes in the shade, and she went away. And the Torah says that Hagar started crying out to Hashem for help. But when the Torah says that Hashem answered, that when Hashem heard the cries, it doesn't say that he, that Hashem heard the cries of Hagar. It says, es kol naar that he heard the voice of the Naar, of the boy. el Hagar Hagar. And then it says, Ki shama lokim el kol ha-na'ar. Again, Hashem listened to the Na'ar. But it never said that the Na'ar was crying. It only says that Hagar was crying. Hagar was crying out loudly. It doesn't say anything about Yishmael crying, but yet Hashem heard the boy and not the mother. So the rabbi said, the Mepharshim say that very often the silent crying is much deeper and much more painful to listen to than the loud crying. The victims of abuse in our community, and there are many, and there are many out there that are not yet safe enough in our community. They do not yet feel accepted and understood to get up and say what happened. And that's the reason why it takes such her her heroism for those who have been able to come forward, and they deserve to be treated like heroes. But our job, not only psychologists, all of us have to learn to listen to the silent cries. We've heard about listening to our children. That is an art form, how to listen to a child. There was a 40-year-old man in the office of a colleague of mine with his mother telling his mother, confronting her, how could you have allowed me to go to school every day on the school bus where the driver was molesting me? The mother was surprised. She said, I didn't know. How was I supposed to know? And he says, I told you. She never told me. He says, don't you remember I was six years old and I used to tell you every day I don't want to go to school? Now, which six year, Many six-year-olds don't want to go to school. But this mother needed to learn to think and to ask and to hear the silent cry. Not only does understanding 
and learning and listening to the psychology and the pain and suffering of the victim prevent more abuse, but it's also what heals the survivors. We all witnessed a major miracle recently in Chile. I mean, those of us who, who follow the news, that there were these men who were trapped underground for weeks. And all the psychologists and talking heads on television, Dr. Phil, Dr. Laura, they were all saying that these men are going to be traumatized for life. They're going to come out, they're going to be tzibach and mention. And when they came out, many of them, at least at first glance, appeared to be doing very well. And it was truly miraculous. But as someone who works with trauma victims, I understood that there was a big difference. In the Holocaust, many of the survivors from concentration camp, and I said this to Shabbos, and a woman came over to me afterwards, and she, she was a Holocaust survivor, and she told me I was right. Many of them said the worst feeling, more than the physical abuse and the torture, and the sexual abuse, because that's not written about as much, but there was a lot of that also, was the feeling of hopelessness that they felt that nobody cared. They felt that no one in the whole world cared about them. And she told me that that's why when she came out of the concentration camp for 20 years, she didn't tell anybody what happened to her because she felt nobody wanted to know. These men who were trapped underground, they were fortunate enough to know that people were coming to save them. If a child knows, and if somebody, if somebody who has gone through trauma knows that they're safe now, and they're cared about now, and that people are advocating for them now, it makes all the difference in the world. One patient of mine actually at one point tried to kill himself because he felt that nobody was listening to him and that maybe by doing such a drastic act, people would then read his suicide note and, and believe what happened to him. And he said that what kills him psychologically is the fact that he knows that most people in our community are very caring and big bali chesed. And that if he was mugged on the street and beaten up, everybody would come running and everyone would want to catch the guy and everybody would want to stick up for him. But because he was raped by his Rebbe, he had to suffer in silence for years and years and nobody was there for him. And then when he started finally talking about it, nobody wanted to hear about it. And as we've heard the story over and over again, the Rebbe is still teaching, he was fired from one school, he went to another school, and, he's, and, and, and this man says, every time he gets a new job, I feel like I'm being raped again. We have to listen, we have to hear, and it's very painful. And I give every person here credit tonight. You know, one person came to Shul yesterday and told me, he came up to me after and said, I didn't want to come and listen to you. I didn't want to hear it. Doesn't involve me, my kids were not molested. Why don't you say a name of the person? In that case, the, the name was Rabbi Templer. And, and, and I think he's, he's, he's local in Brooklyn. Lipa Templer. I'm not sure at this point. The point is that we have to listen, we have to be aware, because by being aware, not only is it preventive, but it also helps the survivors to heal. It helps people feel safe. You can't, you know, there was a couple of suicides that made it into the newspapers. One not so long ago of somebody that it turned out he had been molested. And two days after his wedding, he committed suicide. And I remember that some Askonim wrote that we should learn from this that if you have been molested, you should go to therapy. That's a great idea because therapy can be very helpful to have a safe place to talk about. But it's not enough because imagine doing therapy with a Holocaust concentration camp victim while they're still in the concentration camp being tortured. For a survivor in our community to walk around and to know that it's still happening. 
that this molester is all the therapy in the world will not be enough to make the person feel better. He, there needs to be a feeling that something at least is happening to make the person safe. And as Zwieglach gave a great example, that it doesn't even always have to be. You know, sometimes people were afraid of getting involved because they said, what can I do? I can't solve the problem. I can't protect this person. Someone just spoke to me last night about their nephews. And they said, I feel so helpless because I can't protect them because my brother doesn't want to rock the boat and go to the police. And I said, but you're protecting them just by listening to them and by showing that you're going to try to convince your brother. That feeling of someone standing up for you, psychologically, it makes the victim feel, trauma makes a person feel isolated and alone. It breaks up all attachments. Joel spoke about the concept of reality. You, you, you feel like you're living in a different reality than other people. A completely different reality, so you don't feel connected. If somebody hears you and listens to you and stands up for you, so you can go through a lot. You can go through a lot in life. And therefore, I just I, I repeat it over and over again. It doesn't have to be always that you have the perfect solution. And the person who told me in shul they didn't want to come and hear me speak, it's painful to listen to this. It's painful to accept that there's evil out there in the world and even in our community. But you can feel good, and you can feel, I feel, enthusiastic about the fact that there's so much that can be done. When Klai so puts their mind to it, it comes together, we can have an event like a National Jewish Week, and we can be proud of our community. We can get things done. It's not, the world will never be perfect. But like, you know, other speakers have said we're at a one and a half. Let's move it up a few notches. This event hopefully will lead to everybody coming out and thinking about the problem, talking to other people. And already it becomes less shameful and less difficult for someone to come out and say that they're a survivor. So thank you again.